Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar from the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership Card P. My name is Victor Parson and I'll be hosting today's webinar on challenges of developing antibiotic combinations. With IFS Card P's education and outreach program, it aims to support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded and are freely available to view after the live broadcast on our website, revive.godp.org/webinars. As well as our webinar recordings, you can also read our series of articles known as Antimicrobial Viewpoints. Here, our experts discuss various topics within the field. We also have a resources section, which includes the Antimicrobial Encyclopedia, this has definitions on various important terms in the field, and some of the terms also include videos where experts give a further explanation of the terms. As always, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window as shown on the slide. We will address the questions after the presentations and do our best to respond to as many as possible. Today's speakers are Michael N. Dudley and Glenn Dell. Our moderator today is Carol A. Sable. Carol is a consultant at CA Sable Consulting. Welcome, Carol. I now hand over to you to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Victor. It's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce our first speaker, who is Mike Dudley. Um, as many of you may know, he's both president and CEO of Cupex Pharmaceuticals, which has several compounds in development for treatment of uh, antimicrobial resistance. Prior to that, he was um, CSO at a medicines company. And across his career, he's led the development and regulatory approval of multiple antibiotics. He's also had academic appointments, has written uh, extensively on antimicrobial uh, discovery and development. And it's a pleasure for me to be able to welcome Mike. And Mike, you can start your presentation when you're ready. Great. Thanks, Carol. And, um, and thanks to everyone, uh, the organizers at uh, Guard P, and particularly Victor, for the opportunity to talk to you about some of the challenges involving development of antibiotic combinations. And I'm going to be speaking uh, specifically to the special considerations that one has when developing uh, beta-lactamase uh, inhibitor combinations uh, for treatment of serious infections. Just a quick um, kind of overview of kind of my background as Carol has given, but also what um, Cupex is, uh, is focused on doing right now. We are, are a small company that's based in San Diego area that was spun out of the medicines company in 2018 from venture-backed um, uh, leading healthcare investors to uh, support another early stage antibiotic company. Um, we're focused on, we have three clinical stage uh, products uh, that are making its way towards phase three. Um, these products are specifically, as I'll show you, trying to address uh, what are considered to be the most serious um, infections and where the WHO has designated that there is a critical need for new uh, therapies. And um, we're proud to note that in the 2021 WHO pipeline analysis that was published just recently, uh, that all three of our products are uh, addressing those critical need carbapenem-resistant pathogens, namely Acetobacter, Pseudomonas, and uh, carbapenem-resistant Enterobacter alleys. Now, I'll talk about how we think about combating these resistance mechanisms. Um, we think it's important not only to think about class-based resistance, but also to think about those intrinsic resistance mechanisms that are uh, specifically responsible for multi-drug resistance, that being efflux and permeability mutations, and to make sure one is mindful about that uh, when approaching those. And of course, we're grateful to our collaboration, collaborators um, in terms of being able to put this forward. Most importantly, our, our, our kind of a unique portfolio partnership that we have with BARDA to advance uh, all of our products uh, deep uh, into development. So when we thought about this portfolio, in fact, with uh, in working with our partner BARDA, we really thought about the settings where um, infections take place and particularly those due to multi-drug resistant uh, 
pathogens. They don't just happen within the hospital, but they're increasingly happening in the outpatient setting. And there are some important uses, for example, of you being able to treat those infections in the outpatient sector. Certainly the COVID pandemic uh, taught us the importance of being able to manage patients outside of the hospital. And then also being able to, to conduct some of those important uh, core activities of antibiotic stewardship, such as stepping patients down from IV to oral therapy. But also thinking about those patients then who have the most resistant infections and most challenging infections, particularly those due to multi-drug resistance, Pseudomonas and Acetobacter. And that's how we've overlaid uh, our thinking then with our portfolio with three products that are moving through uh, clinical development right now. Two of those products are based upon a combination, in this case, a combination with a new beta-lactamase inhibitor named Zeroborbactam, or you'll see it also referred to as QPX7728. And the third product then being a uh, novel synthetic lipopeptide, which lipopeptides and polymyxins, as you know, are oftentimes used also in combination with other agents uh, for uh, treatment of serious infections. So in thinking about then and approaching this today, I'd like to kind of uh, organize my, co my comments really according to this outline here. Uh, first of all, in, in focusing on beta-lactamase inhibitors, why do we need new beta-lactamase inhibitors? This has been a, a, a very active area of antibiotic research and development. What's, what are, should be the objectives in developing those agents? Secondly, I think in, in, in developing those and thinking about antibiotic combinations, I think we have to be thinking critically about antibiotic resistance mechanisms and making sure that we're addressing not only class-based resistance, but also those intrinsic resistance mechanisms that can frustrate uh, many of these efforts. And then finally, I'll touch on some of the kind of important things that uh, one has to be thinking about in developing these combinations, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations, particularly some PPK, PD um, concepts and considerations for the inhibitors. How do you design the dosage regimens and think about testing of these compounds? And then uh, lastly, finish up with some observations on clinical trials uh, that are gonna be important. Well, when we talk about multi-drug resistance and, and it's surprising how many people who are working in this field oftentimes don't recognize that um, there really are uh, kind of two ways that you have to think about this and two important considerations. When we think about multi-drug resistance, of course, we think oftentimes about the typical class-based resistance. So beta-lactamase production is, uh, of course, responsible for class-based resistance to um, beta-lactam antibiotics, PAR-C resistance, and others uh, associated resistance to fluoroquinolone antibiotics. And addressing those mechanisms um, is an important part of that. But I think what really comes up to bite you sometimes in the ankle is, is that general intrinsic uh, resistance mechanisms such as permeability and efflux. So in the cartoon on the right hand side of the slide, you can see there in green those considerations of permeability and efflux that can similarly affect either existing classes of drugs, but also new classes of drugs. And as we provocatively asked uh, uh, in a little over a year ago in one of the other Guard P uh, revived programs, is will new classes of antibiotics overcome multi-drug resistance? And we say, well, maybe, um, as long as you're paying attention to general intrinsic resistance mechanisms such as permeability and efflux, and you can have a fancy, shiny new target but if you haven't been able to overcome those mechanisms, you're not really gonna make much uh, progress. And that applies whether or not you're developing a new class of drugs, or it applies on whether or not you're developing a class of drugs that are supposed to overcome class-based resistance mechanisms. And so as we then approach then a beta-lactamase inhibitor, uh, new beta-lactamase inhibitors, what are some of the things that you wanna think about then to overcome the limitations of existing products? Well, one, as we thought about it, was is that extending pathogen coverage. And many of these inhibitors have had variable coverage against Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter, generally pretty good against the Enterobacter alleys, but expanding then and overcoming some of those intrinsic mechanisms to pick up Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter would be important. Secondly, um, many of the um, uh, Inhibitors that have been developed over the last few years have been um, broader in spectrum in terms of their coverage, but still have missed uh, particularly important subsets of these enzymes. Uh, the class B or metalloenzymes have been uh, 
uh, a bit of a holy grail to be able to inhibit uh, to those uh, mechanisms in view of the really different types of, uh, of structure of the enzyme and being able to have a compound that would inhibit both metallo as well as serine enzymes. But also, I think, as I've mentioned, of being able to improve the intrinsic resistance mechanisms or their susceptibility to intrinsic resistance mechanisms, such as permeability and efflux. And then, of course, thinking about increasing resistance that one is seeing now in various clinical settings to existing inhibitors, such as avibactam um, and enterobacter allies. The other thing that we thought a lot, I think a lot about, and it becomes into some of the challenges here, is to actually think about uh, these drugs being able to work not just with one antibiotic, but to be able to work with multiple different beta-lactam antibiotics. And one can start to think about reimagining how a beta-lactamase inhibitor could be used as kind of in the what is oftentimes referred to as the non-traditional sense, where this is a drug that these are drugs that are not co-formulated with beta-lactam antibiotics, as is the current practice, but they would actually be co-administered with beta-lactam antibiotics as a potentiator or as a uh, as a drug that would restore their activity. That's a, what's done in many other areas of chemotherapy. It's done in cancer. It's done in HIV with some drugs that are administered with certain uh, antiretroviral agents to boost their activity. And so, of course, thinking about reimagining these drugs in that type of sense where you could use them more broadly would be important. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, of having oral agents to be able to address those uh, patients with resistant infections in those settings where it's going to be important. Well, I'm going to talk a bit, a bit about then how uh, to think about development of these drugs. And I want to, I'm going to highlight some of our recent efforts with a drug known as Zeroborbactam on the far right there. But I want to walk you through kind of how these generations of these agents with a new class of boronic acid uh, inhibitors that were uh, developed by QPEC scientists um, back in, uh, in the last decade uh, progressed. So Vaberbactam was the first of these uh, new cyclic boronic acids that were approved, uh, regulatory approval in the U.S. in 2017 and in the EU in 2018. Um, this was a new pharmacophore of using boron as the active center for this. Uh, Vaberbactam has very, very potent activity against KPC, but that's pretty much it in terms of its uh, activity. And that really dictated then that it made sense to be developing this drug with a single uh, uh, partner antibiotic known as meropenem. And that's proved and available in the United States as Vabomir and in the EU as uh, Vaborum. But we continue to work, and you can see through generations two, three, and four there, um, through working with bicyclic amides, so 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 fusing another cyclic, uh, another ring structure under the Vaberbactam molecule, as exemplified in the compound 7323, that resulted in increasing then the uh, spectrum of act and inhibition uh, against ESBLs and more class Cs. But the, and the activity against metallobetalactamases began to appear with these molecules. And it was variable, um, no uh, inhibition of AIMP. There are other molecules that are precedented within this class. Uh, the late stage development uh, compound Tanniborbactam uh, is a, an additional um, molecule that was exemplary of the class two type of structure where you've got a little bit broader activity than Vaberbactam. But still, and some MBL activity, but it can be spotty uh, in some strains. We then worked on some uh, working on the bicyclic systems, then to the thioethers, as shown in class three. And that really was a breakthrough in terms of getting broader metallo beta lactamase activity. But then, really, zero borbactam um, really brought home the broadest uh, spectrum against both serine enzymes and metallo enzymes. But most importantly, also brought in then activity against acetobacter because of the engineering of the size of that molecule and being able to evade some of those multi-drug resistant um, uh, resistance mechanisms that can frustrate the activities of these drugs. And if you then look then across then very here are cell-free purified beta-lactamase uh, and look at the inhibitory activity. Low numbers are good here because we're measuring the KI. You can see then in terms of, of uh, various different members of the boronic acid class, such as Zeroborbactam, Vaberbactam, and Taniborbactam, or those uh, that are exemplified in the uh, 
uh, in the DBO class, such as Avibactam and Relibactam, um, you can see then that one can begin to uh, differentiate these compounds based on, on the uh, breadth of, uh, of activity, particularly as their inhibitory activity. But then, of course, what's important is to see if that cell-free activity and inhibition of those enzymes can translate into inhibition uh, in, in cells. And so these are engineered strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa with the varying beta lactamases that are shown listed on the left-hand side. And here, testing in combination with either cephalosporins, penicillins, or carbapenem, such as meropenem, septolazine, cepapim, or piperacillin, and one can then now see that that inhibition of the, those enzymes uh, now translates into uh, activity in whole cells and also potentiation of multiple different beta-lactam uh, antibiotics. Well, what about the intrinsic uh, mechanisms uh, that are responsible for multidrug resistance, not only that can affect the beta-lactam, but also can affect beta-lactamase inhibitors here are studies from our laboratory then looking at these restraints of Klebsiella and pneumoniae that have then varying levels of expression of either porons that are important in Klebsiella, such as the OMPK35 and 36, and then also the ACRAB efflux pump. And what you can see in comparing meropenem MICs alone or in combination with either Weber-Bactam uh, or Zerobar-Bactam is this that you can see then that these general intrinsic mechanisms generally by themselves are not too, uh, not capable of really frustrating a resistance, say, to Weber-Bactam or even Zerobor-Bactam. But then when you get combinations, such as in the last two strains there on the uh, rows there, where you have combinations then of both of the ACRB efflux as well as changes in certain porin proteins, you lose activity with Weber-Bactam, but you can then preserve that then with a compound like Zerobor-Bactam that is minimally affected by those uh, types of mechanisms. So that's microbiology. Then how do we then think about then now translating this in, in a uh, therapeutic uh, point of view in terms of now thinking about PKPD, thinking about dosage regimens and, and testing of beta-lactamase inhibitors and beta-lactams. And we think of that as kind of a two-step process in this challenge. When you're thinking about combinations of drugs, you have different, oftentimes different pharmacokinetics, different uh, uh, dosage regimens, different routes of excretion. So how do you think about that? Well, first and foremost, I think it's important to recognize that beta-lactams and beta-lactamase inhibitors have two different targets. Uh, beta-lactams are, of course, uh, targeting penicillin binding proteins and inhibiting cell wall synthesis. And a beta-lactamase inhibitor is targeting an enzyme. And those activities have two different dose response curves. And that's important to bear in mind when developing these combinations. And so what I would first of all kind of say here is, is that it doesn't make sense to think of these as ratios. There's oftentimes some drugs have been tested as fixed ratios. So you test, for example, the beta-lactamase inhibitor in a, in a ratio of one to four to the beta-lactam. That really doesn't make sense when you start thinking about dose response curves that could be very, very different uh, for those drugs. So my admonition would be is that don't, if you're developing these drugs, don't think about fixed ratios, but think about separate dose response curves, and I'll show you why in a moment. But then also then you need to translate then those, uh, those uh, dose response considerations into dosage regimens um, that are going to then be able to translate into efficacy and non-clinical models of infection and ultimately inform you about exposures of these drugs that are going to be needed in vivo uh, to get eff efficacy. And I think just to illustrate to you this dose-response relationship, on the left-hand side of the slide I'm showing you, this is a dose response that you might get for a beta-lactam MIC on the y-axis and the beta-lactamase inhibitor concentration on the uh, x-axis that you might get from a typical checkerboard uh, MIC type of exercise that you would do in the uh, microbiology laboratory. And you could certainly see then as you increase the beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, you would see a decrease in the beta-lactam MIC. And that uh, would ultimately fall, at some point, you would find a concentration of the beta-lactamase inhibitor, uh, beta inhibitor that has essentially uh, uh, eliminated the effect of the beta-lactamase that's produced by the organism. But then you can also think about this in terms of a population consideration, where you could then test 
a population of resistant isolates uh, with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. And you can then look at then the, the sort of the percent of strains in that uh, population of resistant isolate and the uh, beta-lactam MIC with varying concentrations, in this case of fixed concentrations of the beta-lactamase inhibitor. And then ask yourself to compare the potency of this uh, beta-lactamase inhibitor at very different concentrations. What is the concentration of the beta-lactamase inhibitor that brings that beta-lactam MIC to the, uh, to the 90% of them being inhibited? In this case, you can see that at the high concentration, say of eight micrograms per ml of the beta-lactamase inhibitor, you can see that the beta-lactamase MIC is lowest and they're at 90% where that brown line is intersecting that 90% uh, line. And we refer to that as the uh, TPC90 or the target potentiation concentration for 90% of strains. It's kind of like an MIC90, but in this case, you're expressing the potency here of the inhibitor compared to what you're uh, you normally thinking of a, as an antibiotics MIC90. This is a, an expression of potency here of the uh, of the inhibitor itself. And so this allows you then to begin to hone in on what your target concentration should be for inhibiting uh, the beta-lactamase and maximally affecting the uh, effects of the beta-lactam MICs. And here's in a, a rather busy slide here, but what this is showing you is a result of a checkerboard experiment of around 600 isolates of, uh, of Enterobacter alleys. Here we're using meropenem in combination with Zeroborbactam or QPX in the table. And so then you can see across the columns on the top, the increasing concentrations of the inhibitor. And then you can see that in each of the entries for the various different cuts of the population, whether they're MBLs or whether they're non-MBLs or OXA48 producers and so forth, at four micrograms per ml of QPX7728 or zero borbactam, you know, all of these subsets of that 600 strains are all have MICs that are now 90% inhibited uh, for meropenem when you're using it in a fixed concentration of four micrograms per ml. So we think that that's an important uh, number and an important way to then think about the types of exposures that you're going to need then to be able to bring 90% of strains um, within uh, the uh, susceptible range. And you can then, of course, begin to now look at then how this translates in vivo. And this is a paper. This is from a paper published in 2020, where we looked at then varying different partner beta-lactam antibiotics at their humanized exposures, whether they were a carbapenem, whether they were a monobactam such as astreanam or a cephalosporin such as ceftazidime or ceftolazine. And one can see then at the dosage regimen here a fixed dosage regimen that you could get then in vivo potentiation of all of these beta-lactam antibiotics um, uh, against this KPC2 producing strain. And so one can get efficacy against multiple beta-lactam antibiotics when you've kind of engineered the molecule then to um, have properties that would be compatible with, mul with, with multiple different beta-lactams. But of course, the real important part then is to be able to then translate this into a dosage regimen in vivo. I'm going to switch now to the first generation agent, meropenem vapor bactam, because I want to show you, since we don't have phase three results for, um, for zero bar bactam, I want to sort of begin that transition here to show you how one then can take a dosage regimen of a beta lactamase inhibitor, in this case, vapor bactam used in combination with meropenem, and be able then to express the efficacy here against five strains of Klebsiella pneumoniae with varying MICs of meropenem in combination with Weber-Bactam. And in this case, we found that the free 24-hour Weber-Bactam AUC normalized to that meropenem Weber-Bactam MIC uh, was the best uh, pharmacodynamic indice that described the in vivo bacterial killing with a one log drop occurring with a, a, a AUC to MIC ratio of around 38 in this case. That then can be then um, uh, combined then those that thinking with then data that would allow you to think about the pharmacokinetics of these drugs when used in combination. Meropenem vapor bactam was very unique um, in that the way that the humans uh, cleared the drug in terms of renal clearance as well as total clearance were very, very the same. In fact, when you went and gave, did studies in patients with renal impairment, 
uh, where you look at EGFR there in the graph uh, on the x-axis and the total clearance on the y-axis, you can see that, of course, is that re as renal function then decreases, the total clearance decreases, but the slopes of those two lines of meropenem and Weber back cam are identical with a, uh, a slope uh, estimated here of 0.08. So that made uh, dosage adjustment in patients with renal parent very, very easy in that case. You're not always lucky uh, in, with other drugs, and therefore you have to take a, a other uh, steps in doing that. But in this case, it was quite easy because these drugs were well matched uh, pharmacokinetically. And then, of course, you can then do Monte Carlo simulation. Um, these are data from a phase three trial from meropenem vapor bactam in patients with either CRE infections or CUTIs. You can then uh, look at various different strata for creatinine clearance in this case and look at the target attainment, um, as I mentioned earlier, for both a time above MIC of meropenem of 40% and a vapor bactam MIC, uh, AUC to MIC ratio of 38 uh, for a one log drop. And you can see then across all of those subsets of patients that the um, uh, target attainments were high. But lastly, let me just make a few comments about studying uh, patients with resistant pathogens, because that's where we're oftentimes interested in trying to get information uh, about where these new drugs uh, uh, are used and how eff efficacious they will be. And these are results from a phase three trial with meropenem vapor backcam against best available therapy, which was oftentimes a colistin based regimen uh, that was uh, undertaken. Uh, this was the largest randomized controlled trial for re supporting registration of a beta lactamase inhibitor uh, combination that I am aware of. And what this study was uh, was showing then was is to take patients who had suspected or documented uh, bacteremia or complicated intra-abdominal infections or HAP, VAP, or CUTIs uh, due to carbapenem-resistant organisms and randomizing them to what was considered to be best available therapy at that time or monotherapy with meropenem vapor bactam uh, at the dosage regimen shown there. And then we uh, assess the uh, efficacy of these patients. And the results showed uh, that, uh, that, that indeed meropenem vapor bactam was in fact superior to what you could get with best available therapy. Again, most of the time, uh, patients receiving um, colistin based regimens within this. It was, a, it was a better in all the subgroups that you would care about, particularly about those with bacteremia, or HAPVAP or other subsets as shown on the slide there. And of course, we saw reduced nephrotoxicity as you would uh, be comparing meropen and vapor bactam compared to many of the best available therapy regimens that would include uh, colistin. But I think one other thing to think about here is in, when you're doing trials is to think about what about the failures there. And, and as you can see in the meropenem vapor bactam group, there were actually eight failures. And so it was interesting for us to actually look at why did these patients fail, or what was unique about these patients um, that actually failed. And it, it turned out that of the nine prior antibiotic failures, the total nine that were seen within the meropenem vapor bactam uh, uh, group, two, uh, only two had a clinical response. So that means seven of those eight were really explained by previous administration of IV antibiotics that didn't, uh, that ultimately didn't work within those patients. And actually conducted a post hoc analysis that if we remove those patients from prior antibiotic failure um, there, so if we took out those nine patients who had prior antibiotic therapy, and then compared both clinical cures and microbiologic cures and mortality against best available therapy, those differences in efficacy were further um, amplified. So that brings up, I think, two points. One is, is that if you're going to be able to impact patient uh, outcomes, you've got to be using these drugs early in therapy. Waiting for them to earn a new antibiotic by failing an old one isn't a very good idea. This is similar to the type of data that Tom Ludis and his colleagues have shown, that if you wait to get active antibiotics, you're going to run into trouble. And then secondly, I think, though, it also presents problems in studying patients with these types of infections because they're going to be, uh, their failures can certainly bias their uh, response to uh, newer antibiotics. So in, in summary, let me just kind of conclude with these points here is, is that a, a beta lactamase inhibitors have become an important strategy for overcoming class-based resistance. Um, our, our thinking on this, as we have uh, looked at um, both older drugs as well as I think the experience with Cefderacol, uh, 
uh, has also um, borne out that we don't think that any beta-lactams should be developed anymore without a beta-lactamase inhibitor, and particularly a beta-lactamase inhibitor that's going to have broad activity against serine as well as metalloenzymes. And we think that the, the resistance problem with this class and the resistance problem in general dictates that you really got to be anticipating being able to uh, address that over the long term. You need to think about general intrinsic resistance mechanisms as well as class-based resistance when you're innovating new or old drugs um, here. Um, you can certainly then innovate some of these agents uh, to have better activities, but without improved PK and PD properties, um, that can be a, a challenge in terms of their um, development uh, and therefore need to be mindful of integrating PK, PD. And then lastly, just in terms of controlled trials in these patients are very difficult to conduct and interpret. I didn't mention that, that Tango 2 study that I just showed you, we had to screen about 100 patients to get one of valuable patients. And even when you get them in the trial, uh, it can oftentimes be a challenge to interpret the uh, clinical response. And my own view is, is that I think that th that data may be best obtained by some of these alternative approaches that have been maturing in the recent years, such as using real world evidence. So thank you. And I'd like to thank my colleagues as well as uh, BARDA for the, uh, uh, for the efforts here. We have a lean and that mean team that's uh, been able to bring uh, multiple drugs uh, forward. Thanks, Carol. Hey, thank you, Mike. Priest, that's a great talk. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Glenn Dale, and uh, Glenn is the Chief Development Officer at BioVersus. Um, he has had over 25 years of experience in research and development of antibiotics, and prior to BioVersus, he was actually the head of the Antibiotic Discovery and Early Development Group at Polyfor, and was one of the people instrumental in taking mere pivotant from preclinical studies into phase three and has well, not only with that, but with his other prior experience, a great deal of um, experience in defining and implementing development plans. So pleasure to have you here, Glenn, and you may start your presentation. Thank you, Carol, and thanks for the introduction and to Gar P for an inviting me here today and to Victor having to put up with me all summer being slow with my slides. And I'm sorry about that, but summer holidays are there. So I, when I was first given this talk by Victor to talk about fixed dose combinations, excluding beta-lactam, beta-lactam A's combinations, I was a little bit struck because I couldn't think of too many, certainly not too many that are used widely. So I had to go back and I thought, well, okay, this is a good challenge. Let's, let's try to look at this and see what we can do. So why do we want, is there a rationale for a fixed dose combination? And, and there is when you think, you know, we can restore the activity of an agent. This is really the rationale behind the lactam, lactamase inhibitor combinations, which, which Mike just gave a fantastic talk on and worth listening to a second time. And this is really by far the most successful use of fixed dose combinations. We can increase the efficacy. Mostly this is the link for the link with the search for synergy. Most successful of this, I would say, is uh, the trimethoprene sulfamethoxazole combination. I'll come to that a little bit later. But also to reduce the risk of resistance development. And this is really the rationale behind these TB therapies or the HIV therapy, where we have at least two, it's up to four different drugs in it put together to really reduce the chance of resistance. So if one does become resistant to one of the drugs, at least three of the compounds are there to be able to kill the resistant clone. What I found was also to broaden the spectrum. And I, this isn't only now for for typical topical ointments, but I've seen this also for other combinations. And it's really to, to bring in the gram positive agent with the gram negative agent, really to, to, to broaden the spectrum of the, the combination that you would have. And a typical example, of course, would be the, tip, the topical ointment, but with an antifungal, perhaps an anti-inflammatory steroid and, and two antibiotics. And one thing we shouldn't, forget about is also to increase compliance. So if we could get four molecules, four pills into one pill as a combined therapy, actually this would increase the compliance of the patient. So there is a lot of logic in fixed combinations, but logic sometimes doesn't prevail. 
So I, I asked myself, how many are actually out there? And I found this fantastic paper. It's by Bortone et al. in 2021. And what they looked at, of course, this is 2015, 75 countries. And they looked for the number of fixed dose combinations being used. These were mostly, as you would expect, lactam, lactamase inhibitors, different sulfonamide, trim trimethoprim combinations, but a lot of other combinations which you generally don't hear about or don't use. And, and if you look at the number of different agents there, you see a lot of combinations within a class. For example, I only knew of the sulfonamide, the sulfamethoxyl trimethoprim. And when we looked at this again, and they looked deeper, actually 80 of these fixed dose combinations are in India, 25 are in China, and 19 are in Vietnam. And of these, 92% have not been approved by the FDA, and 82% are not compatible with the WHO essential medicines list. So a lot of these are just put together, trying to broaden the spectrum, trying to increase the activity, and people using these. This was in 215. I, in, in the meantime, many of them have been taken off the, the shelf, but they were still there. And looking at the sales of these, it's really, if looking at this, two, con, two the um, amoxiclav and the, the sulfur trimethoprime, they're really in 75 countries, uh, all the countries that were investigated. But some of these, like cefixime or floxacin is in one country. We have the azithromycin, cefixime in two countries. And, I just didn't know that these combinations existed. We had to look deeper to find these, but people are using them, they're finding usefulness, but by far the most sold antibiotics are the ampicillin clovanic acid and the TMPSMX, and these are sold actually globally. I have my own experience here, and this was actually a recent experience. I went to the far, I had a, an attack from black flies. Now I went to the pharmacy and asked for at, after bite, and what I received was this, maxibiotic. And I thought, well, this is pretty interesting. It's pretty cool, as they say. And it's a combination of neomycin, polymyxin B, and bacitracin in Vaseline. I'm sure this hasn't been approved by the FDA, or it's certainly not been reviewed. This is just a mixture put together. And so we really don't need to look far in Europe to find these interesting combinations. They're not just in the East, but they're also in the West. And we have to keep that in mind. So I, there's a bit of history here, and I think this is really important to look at. And this is, a, this is a, an adaption from a paper from Podolsky and Green in 2011. And what they documented was the hope, the hype, and the harm. And this is all something that went on in the mid-19, let's say, 1950s to 1970s. So there was the hope, and this was your proposed biochemical synergy between therapeutics for acute illness. This is your basically your Bactrim, your trimethoprim plus sulfamethoxazole. This is still with us today. We had the hype, we had the, the synergy that was often claimed, but actually no, no proof of improved efficacy. This could be your sigmamycin, tetracycline plus olanodomycin. And actually this led to a few problems and, and then finally we had the risk and, and this was a fixed dose combination of uh, tetracycline plus novobiosin this is before my time so it's quite quite old but i do know novobiosin but the combination proved less effective and actually more toxic than the monotherapy so then in 1971 the, the fda declared that any new combination drug would require proof that it offered a therapeutic advantage over each of the components administered separately. Seems to make sense. And then it came the combination rule. And Bactrim was actually the first drug to follow that rule, if I am not mistaken. So let's take a look at this rule. This is the FDA combination rule. It's easy to find. It's a 21 CFR section 300.50 fixed combination of prescription drugs for humans. So the rule states, each component must contribute to the claimed effects. And the dosage of each component is such that the combination is safe and effective for the intended population. There's two special cases of the rule for the addition of a component that enhances the safety and efficacy of the principal active and to minimize the potential for abuse of the active. <clears throat> but the rule itself, as simple as it seems, this has a, a very significant implication on the development of new combinations. 
And so if we look at what the practical implications of this combination rule are, it's very simple, really. For, for example, if drug A is to be combined with drug B, then the following treatment arms may be required to demonstrate that each component contributes to the overall effect of the fixed dose combination, meaning that we should have a placebo control, we should have drug A, drug B, and then drug A plus drug B combined. That's, that's really four clinical trials at this point. Clearly for antibiotics, we realize you can't have a placebo control. There's very few indications where that would actually be allowed. Drug A is usually known. Drug B may be a known agent, and then a lot of these fixed dose combinations which I discussed earlier would actually have to be tested as drug A and drug B. So therefore, most of this 119 combinations wouldn't exist because just the, the, the effort to do that wouldn't be worth it. And so if it's a new agent, drug B, then you're really looking at two clinical trials, drug B alone or drug A and drug B. And they do offer an out with this. They offer you a superiority study, albeit with a higher, a higher, uh, a little bit less secure on the effectiveness. They would take a maybe take a, a p value of higher than 0.05. So the development paths will really depend on the features of the combination partners. And I think this has really affected the development of, of new antibiotics, at least in fixed dose combinations. So let's look at a couple of examples here. This is the TMP XMX. So sulfamethoxyl, it's a sulfonamide. It inhibits the dihydropyteroate synthase, and that's the production of the dihydro dihydropyteroate from P amino benzoic acids, so PABA, and the DHPPP, 6 hydroxymethyl 7 8 dihydropyterone pyrophosphate. We also have trimethoprene. This inhibits the uh, dehydrofolate reductase and it's the production of uh, dehydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. <clears throat> and it is generally accepted that the potent synergy between these two drugs derives simply from the sequential inhibition of the adjacent steps. So we inhibit two enzymes in the same pathway, we get synergy. But actually, it seems more recently, this is Min Minato et al., they showed that the THF is critical produce, the substrate for the earlier enzymes. And actually, there's a feedback loop inhibition, and this may be what's causing this, the synergy. But anyways, the combination does display synergy both in vitro and in vi vivo, and overcomes resistance to sulfonamides, and to a lesser degree, we have to be honest, to trimethoprene. But what evidence existed at the time for an approved efficacy. So this was actually quite hard to find. So TMP-SMX was introduced in the US in 1973 after about five years of use in Great Britain and, and selected other European countries. The studies were neither powered for non-inferiority or superiority. So these were all smaller studies, Apple studies, but they were smaller studies. And I just take this one example here, 1972. This is Brumford and Purcell. They compared TMP-SMX to ampicillin, cephalexin, and trimethoprim itself, so a part of the TMP-SMX. And the interesting part here was there was really no difference between TMP-SMX and efficacy, so the, the cure rate, or trimethoprim alone. And neither showed resistance development in this study, or at least they didn't, weren't able to show that. So the overall result, results from the patients show that TMP, SMX, and TMP give similar cure rates. In that study, there was no evidence of resistance caused by the organism responsible to the infection. <clears throat> in fact, when we looked at the older studies where they compared TMP, SMX directly to SMX because sulfonamides were the standard of care at the time, it worked equally well when, when it was a sulfonamide susceptible strain. So, so sulfonamide susceptible strains, they, they responded equally to TMP, SMX, or sulfonamide. It was only when you had the sulfonamide resistant strains in the mix did you actually see the benefit of TMP, SMX. But then you're really looking at the TMP activity alone and not the SMX activity, although in vitro we did see the, the synergy there. So, TMP SMS, it is a great drug and it's standard of care. We, we can all agree on that, I think. But the, the question is, is under the current regulatory environment, would TMPX be developed or even get approved? And this is something we have to think about when there's 9 billion units sold every year in the world. <clears throat> 
So fast forward 50 years, <clears throat> rifampicin and colistin. So the combination of colistin and rifampicin for the treatment of MDRA Baumani, it, it is well accepted that rifampicin and colistin can synergize in vitro when tested against the selected strains of Baumani. It's not all strains, but certainly a selected set of strains. This has also been shown that rifampicin can potentiate the effect of colistin in vivo against selected isolates. Various clinical studies, albeit non-powered, showed a clinical benefit of treating serious abomani infections with the combination of rifampicin and colistin. These are Bassetti et al., there's Ademir et al. in 2012. There were studies really just on colistin-resistant abomani. This is Park et al. in 20, 2019, and they did show a benefit of the combination of colistin plus rifampicin versus colistin in these subjects. But essentially, this was a rescue therapy study and, and a very small sample size. However, there was a large study, and this was Durante and Mangoni et al. in 2013, where they compared directly colistin plus rifampicin to colistin and showed that it failed to demonstrate a meaningful benefit in mortality, but rather only in the microbiological eradication rate in the combination arm. And in the study, all isolates, unlike the TMPSMX studies that were earlier, in this study, all isolates were XDR, but susceptible to colistin, so an MIC of less than or equal to two milligrams per liter. So the net result of all these studies is the recommendation not to use the combination of rifampicin and colistin to treat MDR Baumani, and it's probably a prudent recommendation at the point. But let's look at some of the details here on the microbiology. There are some interesting aspects to this. So in the durante mangoni study, all of the isolates were colistin susceptible. And at randomization, the colistin MIC to all isolates was less than 0.5 milligrams per liter. So we're looking at the lower end of the MIC range, so very susceptible. So colistin, in fact, is expected to work in all subjects, a lot like TMP or SMX is expected to work in those subjects who retreat, re receive the combination. Interesting was, is no resistance to colistin was observed during treatment or at follow-up in any subject in either arm. So if we, were, if we want to look at prevention of resistance as a clinical endpoint, this would take a huge sample size, at least based upon this data. And even in the subgroup of patients with a rifampicin MIC greater than 16, which was assumed to be an RPOB mutation, there was no difference in the primary outcome, although there was some benefit in the microbiological data. In the PARC study, now this is the 2019 study looking at colistin resistant isolates, only partial synergy was observed between the two agents, not all isolates showed synergy to the combination. But the ones that did show partial synergy, at least based upon an e-test, seemed to improve or have a better outcome. So they said this may be a good prognostic factor. However, we have to keep in mind the sample size was very small and all of these results must be taken with caution. So clearly there's a disconnect between the microbiological response and the clinical outcome. And I, and I think this would also be the same with the TMPS SMX study. If there was resistance to the main partner, then the effect was there, but if not, there was no effect of the combination. So is it, in this case, is it really possible to show a mortality benefit in this population with this combination? It's a, it's a question I can't answer. They wouldn't do it, couldn't do it, but I'm not sure it's possible. So what we did, this is something where we're interested in this in-house. So this is just some in-house data and it's worth considering. So what we proposed was, well, if, if colistin is synergizing rifampicin or if rifampicin is being synergized and actually a low dose of colistin, so at this point, let's take a 0.125 milligrams where, where the polymyxins are essentially inactive, we should be able to see a synergistic effect. So we should see a shift in the MICs. So we did this on 293 crab isolates. We tested this in combination with polymyxin polymyxin B or, or colistin, and rifampicin. We tested it really at the low dose because we want to see the synergy over a very large panel. And in this case, rifampicin MICs were generally less than 16 milligrams per liter, so we didn't have many of the RPOB mutations. But 
what can learn from all of this is that actually the the activity the microbiological activity is driven by the polymyxins it's not driven by the rifampicin so the idea that the polymyxin would be a hole puncher opening up the 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 organism for the rifampicin to come in is not really the case the the polymyxin drives the the effect and so if we think about it can we really expect a effective rifampicin on the treatment of MDR A baumani when the polymyxin is already very active. And for this, I, I ask to consider again the TMP SMX versus the TMP data or the TMP SMX versus the SMX data. So not all is lost. There is still hope for new fixed dose combinations. There is this, the FDA guidance on the treatment of serious infections with an unmet medical need. This is a revision from May 2022. Mostly I, I read some positivity in this on point four or some other characteristics that has a potential to lead to enhanced effectiveness. So the development of any new antibiotic uh, at fixed dose combination or not will benefit really from an early discussion with the regulatory agency because the the, the the guidance is there, it gives you some idea of where to go, but there's a lot of, let's say, openness to the interpretation. And I think you need to go with your data, the appropriate data to support your arguments to fit one of the above four points, which can be done with a fixed dose combination. Now the EMA has a, a slightly different view on this, and there's a couple of very re relevant guidelines for fixed dose combinations. One is the guideline on clinical development of fixed dose combination medicinal products. This, this is from 2017 and as well as the revision three of the guideline for evaluation of medicinal products and indicated for treatment of bacterial infections. And this is from 2022. But both guidelines enable a path forward for the development of novel antibacterial fixed dose combinations. So in some specific points to consider for an F FDC, and this again comes from the guidance, and this is section 6.3 of the revision. There's a point there, a combination of antibacterial agents to be co-formulated or co-administered. And so there is a, they, they actually mention it directly in this guidance and there is a route forward to that. And, but they do say that the in vitro studies that target MDR organisms, and let's say, for example, a carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter mani, the combinations of antibacterial agents in vitro studies should demonstrate that the combination is as active and a higher proportion of the target strains than either of the agents tested alone. So we really need to see some benefit of the the combination. It's really not just A and B together. There should be something a little bit more. And so they do define a path forward for an FDC following a limited treatment options pathway. So a lot of this, I want to still discuss a little bit about a potentiator and it's something we do in TB, but it's still in, in tuberculosis, but it still fits the, the pathway that we're following. And this is our, our combination that we have at, at BioVersus. It's BVL GSK 098. We developed this in conjunction with, with uh, GlaxoSmithKline's at GSK. And the pro project has been funded by the Wellcome Trust, the IMI Trick TB Consortium, and as well now for the Phase 2A trial with the EDCTP. So I thank those funding agencies from the beginning for supporting this project. But so ethionamide, prothionamide, these are previously been mainstay of shorter and longer pulmonary TB therapies. They're used as part of treatments for TB meningitis and this simply because of very good CSF penetration. But in clinical practice, it's limited by the dose related GI toxicity. So the recommended human dose of 750 milligrams or one gram daily, it's really poorly tolerated. So the incidence of the GI effects, you can see at 500 milligrams a day are probably 50% and at, at one gram a day, 100% of the subjects have, have uh, GI effects, which leads to a very large discontinuation of, of the therapy. So we know that a 250 milligram dose is really is known to be well tolerated, but it has limited efficacy. So this was our, our kind of our, our starting of this project. We thought, well, 
if we could potentiate or boost the effect of ethionamide, then we would have a potential game changer. All we would need is the same effects, efficacy at a lower dose, which is much well tolerated, and this could then find clinical utility. So we set out to do that. We know that ethionamide, its, it's, it's bioactivation is through the ethionamide R, ethionamide A activation pathway. And the, the ethionamide is activated. It's a prodrug. It gets turned into a drug, and then it hits its target, the INH A, inside the cell. So the bioactivation occurs through the enzyme ETHA, which is controlled by the transcriptional regulator, ETHR. And we knew we had to overcome that resistance. So we set up a screen there and looked for potentiators or molecules which could overcome that uh, inhibition from the ETH, R, and A. So, but due to this limited bioactivation, it really is, the high dose of ethionamide is required, and this is causing the problem. So the resistance is observed through the bioactivation pathway. This is ETA mutations, and of course, that's where I was suggesting we did get around that with this novel screen. We did that and we found that we could activate VIR-S and activate the MIM-A pathway by, by potentiating or blocking or in, interacting with the VIR-S. And therefore we needed much less drug in the presence of the bvl gsk 98 to actually get the same level of activation in the cell. And this allowed us now to act potently on the VRS, again, the mediated pathway. We get a lot of, of the active form at much lower doses. And most important, it overcomes ethionamide resistance because we're going through a completely new pathway for the activation of the drug. How does this look? This is just uh, 83 uh, isolates that we are tested in the midget. This was tested at ITM in, in Belgium. And what we have is the activity of the ethionamide in, in this particular case is, is roughly an MIC of an MIC 90 of roughly four to eight. Whereas with the boosted ethionamide, the BETO as we call it, the, the MIC 90 is at 0.5. And so what we're looking at now is this also on the INH resistance. So the isonizide resistant isolates, which are of interest, we keep the activity there. But more also importantly, we also maintain the activity on the ethionamide resistant isolates. And this we see in the, the bottom right hand corner of this of the slide. So the boosted ethionamide, it keeps the potent activity on, on isonizide resistant isolates, but also on ethionamide resistant isolates, and of course, therefore on the MDR isolates. So we really potentiate the activity in a lot of the ways that one would consider a beta-lactam or lactamase, but in this particular case, it's an ethionamide and a transcriptional regulator inhibitor. This, this also translates into a kill effect. We have here just a kill curve. We're looking at the, the time, it's over days, up to two weeks now. And we have ethionamide at one times the MIC, at 10 times the MIC, and we compare this to Isonizide at 10 times the MIC. And in the presence of the booster, actually very low concentrations of the potentiator, it's 0.025 milligrams per liter. We have the same killing effect, if you like, over 15 days as we, we see was isonizide at 10 times the MIC without the regrowth. And so this is a fantastic result showing the, the, the potential of ethionamide as it is ethionamide, what is killing the cells but it's just a question that we're getting more activated drug to the target. This translates also in vivo. This is an in vivo study that was, that was done in the, the lab of Nicholas Viziris at the Pasteur Institute. And we have the initial load, we have the untreated growth over, over four weeks, and we see the effect of the, the treatment of uh, boosted ethionamide plus differing concentrations of the, the booster. So, at all at 15 milligrams. So we're lowering the, the effect of the human, let's say effective dose of ethionamide, which is roughly about 80 milligrams per kilogram. In this case at 200 milligrams per kilogram, we get the log, one log and with, in the presence of the booster, we're lowering this actually to 15 milligrams per kilogram of ethionamide, really just activating the ethionamide. 
So in this study, you know, etionamide, protheonamide, they really are excellent drugs. If they're full efficacy, could be exploited or better tolerated. So BVLGSK, it's, it is the first in class of a new chemical entity with a novel mode of action. We're targeting a transcriptional factor. In this case, it overcomes etionamide resistance, which was key to the product project. We make Ethionamide is rapidly bactericidal as isoniazide. And this is really important because this is one of the mainstays of the tuberculosis therapy is the rapid killing. And this is why isoniazide is actually so useful for that. And that we can overcome isonide resistance is, really allows us a, a potential treatment option going forward. And we reduce the frequency of resistance. I didn't show this data, but we finished the phase one study and the phase two A study has actually been initiated. We have uh, We've submitted that to the South African authorities, and this will be run by TASC and, and Andres Daikon Group in South Africa. And with that, I would just like to summary and say about a way forward. Many combinations have been marketed, but the majority have not been thoroughly evaluated. I think this is very clear. The combination therapy is regularly used in the treatment of infections requiring longer duration. So if we look at prosthetic joints, if we look at uh, uh, osteomyelitis, it, it seems to be the standard. Combination therapy does have a place in the current AMR environment. We have to be honest about that. And, and in fact, it's used regularly, daily, to treat infections and generally empirically. And it's really dependent on the local microbiology. And so the development of FDCs, the fixed dose combinations, it is common, complicated by the vigorous regulations, the common, for example, the combination rules, but pathways do exist for the development and we have to look for that. And they do have a place in therapy, but really the choice of indication needs to be carefully evaluated because you could end up falling into a hole very quickly. And on my last slide, I would just like to thank all the organ, uh, People who have helped us, again, the IMI, the FPA, the European Union, the GSK, EDCTP, and University of Lille, and all the many people from the various organizations. And thank you. Great. Thank you, Glenn. Very interesting presentation. Uh, we'll now move on to the Q&A session. And so just as a reminder, if you look at the slide, this is the way you would be able to submit questions and we'll try to address as many questions as we have we can in the remaining minutes so we have a few questions um, the first is to mike and uh, the question is if considering darabobactam in combination with multiple beta lactams as opposed to one how do you see the non-clinical and clinical development differing to be able to, to take you know advantage of the what the data view showed <clears throat> yeah, it's a great question, and and um, I'd kind of summarize it a, a, a couple of ways. I mean, one is, of course, is that one would have to ensure, as you do with any of these fixed dose combinations and so forth, to to ensure that there's some non-clinical data that supports that there's no overlapping toxicities between the two drugs, and so those are testable types of things that one can do in various different. Uh, preclinical systems, whether they be in vitro or in vivo. And so testing that, that question uh, is certainly doable. I think the other piece would be, and uh, non-clinically, of course, is to ensure that the exposures with the, ex uh, the uh, uh, proposed dosage regimen in humans that are achieved in animals are going to be able to widely potentiate um, various different partner or companion beta-lactam antibiotics. And, we rely a lot on non-clinical data to come up with dosage regimens, even for fixed dose combinations. Um, one can certainly then, as I illust gave the one illustration, is you can show that a, a fixed dose in that case uh, was able to widely potentiate uh, in that in those examples various different beta-lactam antibiotics. Uh, again, uh, and one would need to be testing various different uh, phenotypes and genotypes of organisms. On the clinical side, I think there's there's kind of a couple of interesting pieces here. One would be, and, and we have had some discussions with regulators, um, both in the uh, uh, in the European Union as well as in the U.S. 
I will tell you that there's uh, that that some of those discussions are also older, and also some of those discussions have wide-ranging conclusions. But I think there's general um, uh, consensus is that certainly some initial clinical pharmacology data that you might obtain in phase one with the two combination with the combinations of the two drugs co-administered would certainly provide. Uh, assurance that there are no drug interactions that were not uh, into, uh, anticipated, nor is any um, overlapping toxicities. And that perhaps then by using, at least for some of the combinations, perhaps the first one, some phase three uh, data of, of showing efficacy in patients um, would be um, helpful. But as I pointed out, you know, doing controlled trials and resistant infections is a pretty tough, tall order. So. At the end of the day, you're still going to be coming, relying on uh, your uh, non-clinical data to really show that you can translate the uh, in vitro whole cell activity into a therapeutic effect. But that be those are some of the thoughts that that I would think of in terms of mechanistically addressing that through non-clinical and clinical studies. Great, thank you. Just one additional question. Um, obviously, each of the beta lactams have different dosing regimens because they have different half lives. So, if you take zerobarbactam and its PK, how do you then align? Now, obviously, if the PKPD driver is AUC, it might make it a little easier. But how how do you think about that? Because that could be one added challenge. Yeah, and so I, I think what I would say is, is that each beta-lactam should always be given at its optimized dose. Um, one of the things that we did in the meropenem vapor bactam program was actually optimized meropenem dosing in a registration trial. Everyone had kind of been using three hour infusions of meropenem at two grams, but nobody had actually ever done a controlled trial. And there was no supportive labeling for that. So each beta-lactam should always be dosed at its optimal uh, uh, dose. And it gets back to that different dose response curve uh, thing that I was talking about. Um, you may find that indeed that with certain beta-lactamase inhibitors, and which is the reason why you may want to pull them apart, that you can dose them at a completely do different dosage schedule than what the beta-lactam is given. So for example, zero-borbactam has a half-life uh, over 24 hours. So it's mm -hmm. almost like when you're dosing it, it's almost like you, the way that you do your checkerboard MIC testing and the fixed, it was a fixed combination of constant concentration of drug. That's basically the way the drug um, is delivered to humans. And so it really then means that you just then would be dosing your beta-lactam on top of that uh, at its optimized dosage regimen. Great, thank you. Um, Glenn, a question for you from the data that you presented on polymyxin B and merfampin. Can you talk a little bit about why you felt that the data you had show that the, the real driver of efficacy was based on the polymyxin and not the rifampin? Glenn, you're on mute. Yeah, good question, actually. So what we wanted to see is that if if the if we raise the polymyxin concentration up, of course we'd fall into its MIC, and so we wouldn't be able to see the activity there. Our idea was, and I guess the idea of polymyxin synergy is, it's sort of like a, a little bit of a hole punching. It opens up the the bacterial membrane for the more hydrophobic antibiotics to come in. This has been shown with nopobiosin and so on. So we thought, well, if we go to a, a point where the polymyxin isn't active, in this case, the 0.125, then anything that activity, increased activity we would see would be actually a result of the rifampicin. But at the end of all, we didn't see a change. The, the activity was exactly the same between, or almost exactly the same between rifampicin and rifampicin plus low-dose polymyxin. So therefore, if we increase the dose of polymyxin, then we would just converge into a pure polymyxin activity. Great, thank you. Um, Mike, a question for you about looking at beta-lactamase inhibitors and reversible binding versus irreversible binding. Uh, obviously, you would look at that. Do you think it would make a difference in PKPD? And can you comment on what type of an inhibitor QPX7 due to ages? 
Yeah, so so it, it's a great question about reversibility and versus irreversible uh, inhibition. Um, I think that that you know reversible inhibition is certainly of of various targets is a as a viable option for many drugs. They don't have to be suicide inhibitors or uh, much like what we think about some of the o older um, penicillonic acids and other types of drugs for doing that. What may actually be important is are the kinetics of the on and off rate um, for the inhibitor compared to the partner antibiotic. And so, for example, there are some examples that you can look at with respect to some of the DBO inhibitors like Durlobactam versus an inhibitor such as a boronic acid inhibitor such as Zeroborbactam. And depending on whether or not you have a fast on or a slow on rate, a slow on rate may actually allow the enzyme to hydrolyze the partner beta-lactam before uh, it actually has a chance to be inhibited. So it may be more important to be thinking about um, you know, kind of fast on, fast off rates um, to be able to um, actually determine um, whether or not you uh, have, a, have a good partner. So, so with zero barbactam, it actually has a very fast on rate uh, in terms of that. It's reversible, but it has a very fast on rate and also a slow off rate, which I think is really important. Great, thank you. Um, a question to both of you. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about challenges with the current clinical trial designs and issues of combination therapy, potentially making it even more complex. Um, do can you talk a little bit about any potential ideas that you might have that could help us overcome some of these challenges? Not an easy question. <clears throat> So Glenn, would you like to uh, go first? Sure, I can take a hit at that one. So I, I think the the kind of study that Mike talked about on the CRE, this is where we have to go. We have to look in the resistant populations. Of course, a, a CRE trial now would be very difficult with a lot of the agents out there, but there are still places we can go. There's the Asana to back to Balmani, that's clearly where really only colistin is the 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 therapy of choice now at this point in time and even there we're looking at 10 to 15 percent resistance pseudomonas maybe and but it's really getting down to the pathogen specific and the and the certain indications and it, it would really have to be a severe indication so i think also pneumonia would be the place to look for this activities uh, uh, another uti trial to look for let's say e coli run-of-the-mill non as, non-resistant E. coli, I, I just don't see how we could show a benefit. Okay, great. Thank you. Mike. Yeah. yeah, a couple of ideas about that. I think one is is that that um, certainly one could do a non-inferiority trial now that in a trial that would include or enrich for uh, carbapenem resistant enterobacter alleys because we do have casavi now uh, and amipenem relobactam and even meropenem bibrobactam as um, as comparators so one could do a non-inferiority trial with certain subsets even powered for superiority if one um, uh, considered doing that so that's a that's a big change that's a, that's occurred uh, now and uh, being able to actually now um, have some reasonable comparators. Um, the Acinetobacter is still a, a challenge area. We're thinking a lot about that as we um, think about our lipopeptide um, and how we would um, do a trial uh, in uh, situations where you're dealing with carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter and how you would do that. And as as Glenn nicely summarized, the, the data on combination therapy uh, with uh, polymix and antimicrobials is messy uh, and not uh, very clear in terms of the benefits of um, combination therapy with um, polymyxin or colistin-based um, regimens. And so that, that I think is a, another area which, um, which I think, you know, our, our thoughts is, is that it, you know, the main reason, and if you read actually the very nicely uh, written IDSA guidance that was put together by Pernita Tama and colleagues that was just recently um, published in print form now in CID. They did a nice job of, of really um, sort of walking that line about um, guiding towards combination therapy, but not but saying there isn't a lot of, of data supporting it. 
and quite frankly, where they came up with the uh, recommendation or, or came down and recommending combination therapy was is that the reason for it is is because the pharmacological properties of polymyxins is, are so crummy that you probably have to have another drug involved. And when you kind of got got into that in terms of you know why use combinations, and I think where they ended up is is because you've got this problem with lack of uh, concentrations that are achievable and in humans that are associated with bacterial killing in animal models, you've got a epithelial and lining fluid inactivation of the uh, potency, and you've got just generalized bad pharmacokinetics of polymyxins that that's probably the only reason that supports um, actually clinically using a combination because the data don't seem to bear out in a benefit. Okay, great, thank you. And I think also the clinical data that has come out recently look showing the limitations of Colistin in clinical trials, including you know your study with Babamir, I think that does you know also thinking about other yeah. combinations. Um, yeah. So, uh, Glenn, can you talk a little bit about the PK of the GSK compound and its compatibility with ethionamide? Yeah, so it's a little bit easier because we well, it's a little bit easier. We, we're not really sure. We believe it's AUC driven, but this is actually in vitro data that we have on that because to do this in vivo and in tuberculosis is next to impossible. So we have the the in vitro data on that. Our, the PKs, it's pretty good. We have a, a good concentration over the MIC through the dosing interval. And so I, I think from that aspect, we combine very well with, with uh, ethionamide. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, a question to both of you. Um, obviously, looking at development of resistance is very important, and a lot of that is done in non-clinical studies. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you approach that, and is you know data in the hollow fiber model, how can that assist in that determination? So, Mike, if you want to go first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I think those are all important pieces that you um, want to get at in terms of, of, of in vitro characterization. So looking at whether or not you can actually um, uh, avoid resistance selection in strains that have mixtures of beta-lactamases as well as some of those in general intrinsic mechanisms. And you know, one of the things that we've looked at, for example, with our compound is, is they say, well, what concentration do you need to have in vitro to prevent selection, you know, in the in in the typical in vitro uh, types of of, uh, of formats? And four micrograms per mL, for example, of uh, zero bar back cam is capable of of preventing resistance as measured by certain thresholds of being more frequent than say 10 to the minus nine, which is a pretty much a, a rigorous and oftentimes well accepted threshold for um, selecting for resistance. And so. Those types of in vitro experiments, particularly in the uh, in the setting of multiple different resistance mechanisms and combinations of those, is really going to be important. Um, hollow fiber models are certainly going to also be an important tool for uh, translating uh, um, a lot of that type of information as well. You know, hollow fiber models can have regrowth that takes place due to resistance. It can take place due to adaptive resistance. It can take place to resistance mechanisms that ultimately aren't important in vivo. So you've got to, to, to really sort out those types of data to make sure that you're um, not over-interpreting what you're seeing within those systems um, uh, uh, in terms of, of, of the resistance. And then I think finally, yes, um, clinical studies um, can help. I, I uh, you know, hinted at this is that I think that that you know our view is is that if you're going to generate really good data in the population of patients that are going to receive the drug, trying to do that in randomized trials is is somewhat of a fool's effort um, because or fool's errand I should say because it um, I think real world evidence um, is a better way to do that. I've been impressed with the types of even single center studies, such as those that are that, that take uh, that are undertaken by Ryan Shields at the University of Pittsburgh and others, where it may be a single stu center study, 
but by doing very careful characterization and culturing and handling of specimens where you can look at emergence of resistance, that provides a wealth of information about newer drugs and, and what may occur, particularly as it relates to emergence of resistance. And certainly the data that he generated, as well as others at the at University of Pittsburgh with Abby Bactam resistance were certainly important for helping us understand um, the uh, importance of resistance, particularly in certain patient populations who are treated with septazin and other back then. Great. Glenn, do you have anything else to add? No, I, I think that was really well stated. The, o the only thing I would like to put caution to the wind somehow is some, some, we're starting to look at new modalities of, of antibiotics. Now, I'll take cefidericol as an example where we have the Trojan horse but dealing with it in vitro and in your Miller-Hinton two broth is actually very difficult. So to run a hollow fiber model, you, you, it is very difficult to run and get good data on that. So we have to, we're stuck in our Miller-Hinton two environment. Somehow we have to slowly think about how we're gonna move to actually be able to evaluate antibiotics, which may not be reflective in the Miller-Hinton two environment. And, so I, I think all of these things are really important. We have to do all of the the assays that are that are normally done, the hollow fiber, the resistance and development. We have to really ensure that we're protecting the the resistance development, or like the rate of resistance development. But a lot of the proof in the pudding will be as exactly as Mike said. It will be in the real world use of the antibiotic and to actually see how this resistance does develop. And it will develop, but it's a question of how quickly and, and do we dose properly. Yeah, Glenn, your 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 reference to cefiterocol is a really good one. And and just as an example for that, um, you know, if you actually test cefiterocol, you know, in either the iron depleted medium or in standard um, growth medium, um, and you particularly as you look at at cefiterocol um, MI, strains of cefiterocol MICs in the higher registers you really do see then how the um, beta-lactamase really uh, you know, is, is oftentimes responsible for those differences. And if you actually then test cefiterocol in combination with a drug like Zerovorbactam, the differences that you see between Miller-Hinton broth and iron-depleted broth disappear. And so that iron-depleted broth by upregulating those transporters you know, to get more drug in is largely because you've got to overcome beta-lactamase that's being produced in those organisms, whether you're looking at Acetobacter or whether you're looking at, um, at uh, enterobacter, carbapenem resistant enterobacter alleys. And so that I think, you know, in our minds really underscores this point that I made earlier is, is the time has come folks that we don't develop beta-lactam antibiotics alone. Uh, the they need to be used and, and, and developed, I think, in combinations. Um, the the tebipenem data shows the same kinds of problems when you start looking at ESBL subset and the UTI studies. You saw a real drop in activity uh, with tebipenem. So we've, it's time for us to move on and think about um, other ways to develop beta-lactams and other ways to use beta-lactamase inhibitors. All right. Thank you. Um, so, Glenn, a question for you. You had mentioned when you're going through the data you have with TB, the possibility that you could have an improvement with TB meningitis using the GSK compound in addition to ethionamide. Do you have any data that you can share about whether or not you've seen that or is that yet to be studied? Uh, well, we, we, we know the effect of the, the low dose of the booster in the presence of ethionamide. And what we do know is that we have a large CNS concentrations of the drug, albeit at, at higher doses that we gave, where we've just ran a large PK study on that and uh, hopefully be able to give very good news in the very near future on that. But it looks very positive. Great, thank you. Um, Mike, one last question for you. We talked a little bit about irreversible, reversible binding. But another um, question that always arises with beta-lactamase inhibitors is, do they have activity or not? And you know, if they do, how does that impact on development or the types of studies you might need to do? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, uh, great question about some of these um, compounds that have activity. I think the first way I would answer that is is that well, it depends on what the potency of those compounds are, and and the rate. So say the ratio of the uh, concentration needed to inhibit a beta lactamase versus the concentration that is needed to have intrinsic activity and. What is that intrinsic activity? Is it membrane breaking, which may not be a good thing, or is it actually hitting a, um, a target? Um, we're actually going to be publishing very soon some new data on zero bore back cam that shows that like some, but not all um, beta lactamase inhibitors, it also has activity against penicillin binding proteins um, and can have inhibitory activity, but generally at concentrations that are much, much higher much, much higher than the concentrations that you need to inhibit beta-lactamase inhibition. Um, we show that that um, even if you select for resistance due to those PBP mechanisms, it doesn't affect the beta-lactamase inhibitory um, activity. So I think, you know, it, the, the major part of it is, is that it still would be used in combination. Um, it's certainly it, that activity may be important in certain organisms which have mixtures of uh, uh, resistance mechanisms or particularly sensitivity. So, for example, carbapenem-resistant non-carbapenemase-producing um, uh, Enterobacter alleys, that may be an important uh, mechanism um, as part of that. So, again, characterizing those uh, activities, um, knowing that if this is just a PPP2 inhibitor or is it more widely inhibit inhibitory against multiple PPPs, we know that the PPP2 inhibitor activity only by itself is really not sufficient um, to get any kind of an in vivo effect. Some of the uh, compounds that uh, Entasis was developing for oral are fall into that category where they have activity against PPP2, but that doesn't translate to any in vivo activity. Mm -hmm. So it really depends upon the specific molecule and um, what the uh, actual mode of action is. Okay, great. Um, I think we have come to the end of the Q&A session. I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, questions and especially to Glenn and Mike for your presentations and um, addressing the questions we've received. So Victor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Carol, for moderating today. And thank you, Mike and Glenn, for your great presentations. You can register for our next webinar through the Revive website. Our next one will be held on the 11th of October, where Manwa Tan and Heike Brutz Osterheld will be presenting on drug discovery strategies and focusing on synthetic compounds and natural products. If you're unable to attend, please do register so that you're notified of the recordings once they become available. So that will be all from me. Thanks everyone for joining today and for contributing to the discussion. I hope you found the webinar interesting and useful and that you'll join us again in the future. Please do spread the word amongst your colleagues and for them to join as well. Thanks again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.